Unity is the new plug we need to use if we, if we want to step forward into the new world we're going into. Without unity, there's no diversity. Diversity without unity is meaningless. We got diversity here, but no unity. Contributionism is where people are unified in knowing that I have something to give, I have something to share. Without the contribution from other people helping me, I would not have my product. Hi everyone, I'm Diva Luther, I'm part of Artisan Alley, and this is our fourth video. We are here to talk with Michael Edwards, and he is a businessman that focuses on this beverage called Misoro. It's a Jamaican tea, it has a spice to it, and it's really good to drink in cold weather, because I've been doing that. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. I mean, you gave me those two bottles and I want to cherish it, you know, so I drink it like one glass in like a week. Okay, yeah. so, favorite flavor. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I have the honor to talk to him today about his thought process, how it came to be. Interestingly enough, I have talked to Michael before in a gallery show in February yeah right before my month before a black history month it was that was my first uh gallery show that i organized oh okay very nice oh, it was pretty nice everyone's just mingling talking about art and i was there and i was feeling a certain way and all we did was just talk about life it was really fun wow yeah so my name is uh, mike ledwich and i have a history of being a traveler Jamaica, West Indies, I was born there, uh, went to New Jersey. I grew up as a child there in New Jersey, and from New Jersey, I went to Pennsylvania for graduate school, and from Pennsylvania, I went to North Dakota to graduate school to get a PhD in chemistry. And, uh, after that, I sort of uh, did an academic thing for a moment at uh, Indiana University and decided to move on and pursue my dream, which is starting a business of my own. And I started making a product, not knowing where I was going with the product. It, it was time to move on and do something different. I, I was experiencing almost like a burnout. And it was not really a healthy environment to begin with, but I moved on to make it healthy. And now I'm healthy. And uh, my beverage has created a new me. <laughs> So basically, that's a little bit of background of myself. The beverage making now, that is something that was not even in the forecast of doing because it's never been done before. No one is able to bottle it and or preserve it naturally without using chemicals. So normally if they make it, they, they use chemicals, which is artificial, and they make a syrup of it. You add water to the syrup, mix it up and drink it. It's all chemical. I made it without the chemicals. Now, my background is I am a medicinal chemist. That was my first degree after undergraduate. I got a bachelor's degree in biology pre-med, and I went to graduate school for medicinal chemistry. This is where I learned about plant products and natural products. Where the drug come from? How do you isolate the drug from the plant material? How do you isolate the drug from the matrix that you're working with? So my product was basically pretty much the same thing. And my job was to extract out the active ingredients in the material that I use. So my background in medicinal chemistry served me well in concoction. That's what many people tell me. Uh, many drugs we use in the pharmaceutical industry come from the plant. They isolate the drug from the plant. Then they will figure out the structure of the drug they isolated because they identified it. And then they will synthesize that drug that they isolated from the natural product and make a chemical which is artificial of the drug that's from the plant. But if you know how to isolate the drug from the plant, you don't have to use chemicals to make the drug because the drug is natural. So in this case here, the drug in the plant is part of my extract. So it has um, hibiscus, ginger, cinnamon, clove, rosemary, and a little bit of cane sugar to carry the flavor, but not sweet, less sugar than orange juice. To my background, prepared me to do what I'm doing. This is not by chance.
like you know how some people would keep their ingredients secret but you don't is there a reason to it many people say to me why do i list my ingredients and i say to to many people because people want to know what they are ingesting now the process of making my product it was a lengthy process after making it i was advised by george gills again gail cook entrepreneur center by ivy tech there's a business center here in town that will provide an aspiring inventor entrepreneur so they will work with you at the time when i made a product the counseling was you need to protect what you have all this is not by chance now all this is methodically done i met with a lawyer i went in there to ask about a patent now with talking to my lawyer he asked me why do i want a patent and i said well i want to protect my product from someone stealing my recipe and then the conversation went into saying well the patent has a duration and when the patent is over everybody have access to what you've made and they can go in there and follow your recipe because the patent got detailed information about how you did what you did boiling filtering everything you've done ingredients how much of each you added to make what you got after the patent is over they can change one ingredient and make it theirs because the patent is over so everybody have access now now you ask the question my ingredients well i got a trademark with a trademark now you can list your ingredients for my audience out there listening to me i'm educating you okay <laughs> <laughs> it can back up me my label I, I'm living my dream, okay? The question was, what's the difference in a patent and a, a trademark? Well, a trademark lists all the ingredients, but not how much of each or how you do it. You have the ingredients, but how much of each did I use? Uh, what temperature did I boil it at? That's not given. So with a trademark, I'm protected. No one can copy it because it's proprietary secrets. The trademark lasts. The patent don't. Okay, with a patent, you got to talk about what's in it, how much, how you did it, what time, this, that, 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 all that. I went ahead and got a trademark. And now my trademark is on any web browser. You can type in Misaro Jamaican Tea Trademark. It pops up, looks very official. You got the U.S. seal. You got the name. And now I am protected with my trademark. And you should be because... It's everywhere, like everywhere I go in Bloomington, I will just see like, hey, Michael, his tea is here. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone in Bloomington saw the logo behind him in a drink before, yeah, he made that. So that's when I know that he gave me this drink sometimes and I'm like looking at the price. He is a very generous man. Honestly, I am by nature a kind person. So when you say generous, that's not an overstatement. That kindness of mine, uh, some people would think it's my weakness, and then they try to abuse me, and I will pull them over and say, no, I did it because I wanted to, not because I'm nice or because I'm kind. I did it because I wanted to, and I didn't have a reason to do it. Isn't it horrible when people are abusing the fact that you're kind? Oh, my gosh. Oh, yes, it's horrible. Just by nature, I'm a kind person. I don't know where it came from. I came into this world like that. Because I got brothers and sisters that's not as kind as I am. My, my kindness is called gullible, for crying out loud. It, it, it's abusive. That's what it is. So I avoid abuse. When I see the abuse come my way, I step aside. I, I, I can I have a radar for people who use people. And my radar goes off and I walk away from them. I don't complain about them. I just walk away. I'm out of here. So you're trusting your gut instinct? I have learned to listen to it. Gut instinct is how I develop my product. Because gut feeling is really, yeah, like you said, it makes you come up with misoro and then it makes you walk away from contradictions. And yes! I'm wondering if that gut feeling also helped you before because you mentioned that you did a different kind of experiment with your business and it didn't work out. When did you know when to step away from that? Ooh. Because that also required gut feelings, I'm assuming. One of the reasons why I was not able to make my product because the feeling on the inside was not right. 
the motivation was not right. The network in my brain, they weren't connecting me. Oh, right, this is where for my audience, this is my tea I make, you know, just a little turnaround, you know, what it looked like. And I learned how to make, this is from the laboratory for analysis. And I learned how to make barcodes. And barcodes is a story in itself, but one barcode has pre numerical values, which you can use for nine other products. So one barcode can be used for 10 products. When I say making it and bottling it and capping it and selling it in the food market, it has to have a shelf life, which is basically important for you to sell something in the marketplace. So a lot of times people can make home product, but a home product they're making is not good enough because the shelf life, there's none. So you put it on the shelf and a week later it goes bad, like bacterial growth or whichever. And the gut feeling is almost like an intuition, you know. So my tea in Jamaica, they make it with hibiscus and ginger. And they add cane sugar, real sweet. And then they add rum on top of it to make a Christmas holiday alcoholic drink. So that's how it's commonly served in Jamaica, at the bars and at social gathering. My mom said company entertaining. She would make it and she'd make it like that and add the rum. And I got older, I started making it and I'll make it the same way. But I said, I don't want to add the rum to it. I don't want to add the rum to it. So with the intuitive feeling, when I took the rum out, made it the same way without the rum, you have to drink it within two or three days. You refrigerate it, a week later, mold grows on it. Doesn't matter. Refrigeration ain't gonna stop it. Room temperature, two days. So in other words, it's not worth bottling. So no one ever done it before because no one knew how to do it. So with my medicinal chemistry background, my intuition led me to the recipe. Intuitively, I knew that cinnamon has the properties of preservative, but cinnamon also lowers your blood sugar. For people who have diabetes, it can lower your blood sugar. And it's a, it's a good um, antimicrobial as well. That did not solve the issue of the shelf life. And then I added clove. Clove is very strong. So too much clove wasn't working. But I liked the flavor of the clove. So I kept the clove without even knowing what I was doing. And then I added rosemary. Too much rosemary, oh my God, rosemary is nasty. Antimicrobial properties, like, you know, preservative, antimicrobial. Even rosemary is good for your skin reverse aging. When I added the rosemary, too much was too much in there. So how am I gonna get it to the place where I want it to be? I played with it, with the right amount of each. Boom, I have a product that is stabilized for one year shelf life. That's a long time. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's what I was told by a couple of the business outlets that I use, the retailers, the grocery stores, uh, Big Red Liquor Stores, uh, Blooming Foods, East and West, uh, up in Indianapolis, Saraga International Marketplace. I tell you that story to say that intuition and my gut guided me. Why I chose those things, that was my gut. If you ask me, did I premeditate making a product like I did? No, I did not. I was experimenting, I was researching, I was being a scientist, that's what I am. So without my science, I couldn't have made it. And the flavor now, the flavor, now, that's the key about it now. That was not my intention. My intention was to preserve it. Uh -huh. The flavor came out of it. The spice and everything was not at all planned? No, that's the point. I let go. And intuition carried me. Yes, I need, I need the science to do the science for the intuition to work. I actually think that you, you know, counted every little thing even the flavor and it's interesting to know that you didn't even expect it to happen but it works out anyway that's the point that's the gift from the the universe should i say something we can relate to and intuitively i followed the instruction that came to me now where it came from i don't know where it came from but it came to me and i listened and i played around with the recipe how long did it take you about a year. Oh, okay. One year to play with the recipe, one year. I did shelf life studies, like make a bottle from this batch, a bottle from that batch, set it out, watch the, the bottles and fermentation and spoilage and mold growth, I watch it, no, not one, not all. 
this one looks interesting. What I do here? I pull my paper. Oh, oh, okay. Let me do that again. Here's the repeat with a label on it. And after that, whew, health department, the rigor of bottling. The, the rules and regulation for bottling is very stringent. And, and a lot of times people get into making something and then they realize that they go through 10 more steps than they stop because too many steps. Our intuition can protect us from people as well. If you listen to your intuition, that person's not good for you, follow your intuition because your intuition is never wrong. So if you let the intuition work, then the universe is with you. You said that it took you a year to come up with Misoro. Does the process involve half research and half creating, or do you create and research at the same time? Good question. Multitasking, yes. But while I was researching, I was doing. I, I didn't gather it all together with the research. They didn't do it. I was doing it simultaneously, testing what I found, put it to work simultaneously. I know many people have different ways of doing things, but honestly, when I first started out doing this, I did not know what I was doing. I knew how to make it like I always do, but to make the product. And when, and when I started it, I had no clue where I was going with it. So research and development, they went together. I think what probably really started out with intuitiveness was there was a young lady I became good friends with. She's from India. I made my tea and I met her mom and the mom liked my tea and the mom asked me how I made it. And I told my mom, I made that before I bottled it many years ago. And the mom threw in cinnamon on it. And once she threw in the cinnamon, that just opened up doors to me and said, wow, this is delicious. Because I never added cinnamon to my beverage before. So really, the beginning of making my tea come from India. On top of the ginger and the hibiscus, I threw in some cinnamon. And then when I started reading about cinnamon, I found cinnamon got properties of antimicrobial and the benefits of, whoa, what did I do here? I like it. On top of the cinnamon, I threw in the clove and I threw in the rosemary. So everything kind of manifested in a way where I couldn't have planned it, could not have planned it. We live in a world of abundance. And if I worry about somebody stealing my stuff, then I wouldn't have a product. I'd be, I'd be hiding, I'd be covering it up. And I'm saying there's enough idea for everybody. If you want to steal it, steal it, call it something else. You can't call it my name. So in the trademark, you see Missara Jamaican tea, trademark is protected. So they got to call it something else. Or I can talk with them and I, and I can use uh, benefits of collecting royalty if you want to use my name, which is all part of having a lawyer to it. So the tea is catching on. Uh, there's a soda now. Yeah, I saw. I saw your updates on it. Kentucky. Chicago, Indianapolis. I'm right now in the tri-state area, pretty much everywhere, not everywhere, but I'm in Bloomington. That's my home base. But let me tell you about the support I've gotten so far. Here's a uh, story which is worthwhile hearing, and I'm glad we're videoing it. And yeah, I can call the name out if I want, but I won't call the name. It will be unprofessional. In Bloomington, I've encountered, call it racial, call what you want to call it. But I've had some experiences that make me think about it. So, I got my product in the store. The product is selling, the product is moving. I go back to fill the shelf, ask for the owner. The owner came to the countertop. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm here to, you know, keep the, keep the shelf filled. Uh, we don't want it anymore. I said, what? We don't want it no more. I want you to play that on the video so you, you know exactly where I'm coming from. Now, when you say you don't want it no more, what am I gonna do? You know what I did? I said, okay, Psst. I don't wanna know why. I'm not gonna give you the privilege or the opportunity to tell me why. All I know is that you don't carry my stuff no more, and that's okay. It happened here in Bloomington, right here. In a couple of places too, here goes the deal. A contract with these small businesses in town is not like a contract. I may sign on with them, but they don't sign a contract that they have to buy from me. That's the hidden agenda there, okay? There's no contract really with, they allow me to put it on the shelf, I got to give it to them at a price where they can move it. I have to sell it to them less than what I would sell to on my own. People think that you have to have a contract with the local business in town. No, you don't. So it's a compromise. It's a compromise. Yes, it is. And if you give it to at a price that you think is good for us, then we can sell for any price that we want. 
So I've seen stuff mark up 100% from the price I give it to them. Now, a good markup normally is like 60%. You pay $4 and you sell it for $7. Some of these people want to have profit margin 80% and above. So when you see the stuff on the shelf, it's been marked up several times. So the discouragement of being marketing and sales, which is what I'm doing. So I'm doing everything all at once. I'm in the kitchen. I'm in the marketing. I'm in the sales. And I'm, I'm just, and I'm distributing as well. Not by myself now. I, I get help now. Don't get me wrong now. I, I started it. And now I do have help. I, I can see the art that I put into the cooking that I do. Because cooking is an art. It's like a different kind of painting. You're painting with the flavors. What you like about my beverage is the painting, okay? <laughs> it's a form of art by itself, you know? <laughs> yes, it is. The bouquet I came up with, people ask me, how did I come up with that bouquet? I said, I don't know, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful bouquet. That's the art me that came out to do what I've done as well. So now you have a kitchen staff, or are you looking for kitchen staff? So I'm looking at scaling up. Right now I'm operating on a 30-gallon capacity, which is a small business. 30 gallons is about 14 cases, 16 cases. But it's not enough volume to build inventory I want because when I first started out, I started out with five-gallon, four-gallon pot to two, and then I went to 10-gallon pots. And then I bought three 10-gallon pots, so I make 30 gallons. So now I'm looking at 100-gallon tanks now. And if I'm going to be paying like that to you, the facility, I'm going to have my own. So right now, I'm motivated to have my own. Now, if I'm thinking too big, too bad. People ask me, how are you going to do that? And I say, well, you know, I don't know. But that's my thoughts. Oh, I have a beautiful business plan. Yes, I do. I've been working on it for a while. It's actually budding up now, budding up. I'm looking at the SBA. Small Business Administration, there's a lot of incentive that's out there. Many people don't know. What I'm finding out is also that people who are in business, they don't talk about how they got their business. And they know you're trying to do the same thing, but they don't come to you and give it to you. So it's, that's unfortunate. I do get the pieces here and there, but I got to do my homework. That's where I'm at. Yeah. All, all this building in Bloomington that's going down, all the building around Monroe County that's going down, that's money for that that I can access and other people can access it that they know that it's not there to access, but no one's talking about it. You say no one is talking about it. I wonder it's because they just want to keep it to themselves in a way that's benefiting them so it won't benefit others. Th that would be it. No one talks about it. So I have spoken with others about building a facility and these individuals, they got their own facility too. And they would say, to me, why, well, why do you want to do that, Michael? You know, why did you do that? How did you do that? So why are you going to ask why I want to do that? Well, whatever you did to do that, I got my reason for why I want to do that. And I don't know if it's because I'm black or because I'm from a different country, whichever it may be. The fact remains that people just don't pass information around. I have this conversation with uh, my fellow artist friends. Indiana Art Society is very small. People know each other. Musicians know other musicians, artists know other artists, you know how it is, it's a small world. Why do people not want to help each other out, you know, like what you said? There's always a way of like helping each other out, benefiting each other just by sharing ideas or sharing advices. People would rather not help each other out or share this kind of information because they think, oh, if I share it, then they will take it apart just assumptions on things that's not probably going to happen. Now, here goes something I want to share. I want to bring up a topic to the plate here, okay? Because you said something which allowed me to go there. Have you heard of contributionism? Yep. So contributionism is how my product came about. If I was to tell this story, I've told you everything so far, but I left out one important ingredient. If I were to end this debut without talking about it, it's like cursing myself. And I can't leave it out. So this product now has been officially on the shelf, officially in the marketplace for two years and four months. So prior to two years, I spent a year developing it. Prior to developing it, it did not exist. So I met a woman. At the time when I met her, I was making this beverage without 
any recipe, anything whatsoever, just making and give it away. In Jamaica, where she is where I'm from, every Christmas they make sorrel, S-O-R-R-E-L, what we call hibiscus in Jamaica. The sorrel Jamaican tea is really me hibiscus Jamaican tea. And then I met one woman and we were dating for a while. And until today, we still talk to each other. We're a great friend. I love it. Total respect. I got to put it out there. So she said to me one day, Michael, why don't you bottle it? Ah, uh, everybody tell me that. Bottling was not in my mind. So a couple months went by, I'm dating her. She likes it. You know, she asked me a question again. So, Mike, you should bottle it. I said, nah, I've been you know, hearing that a lot, you know. Well, finally she said to me, why? Contributionism, key with all we do. If people can only see what it, the benefits of it. Michael, why don't you bother? I said to her, my way of walking away and getting out of it. She said, well, I don't have a recipe and I don't have a label, which was true. I didn't. She's an African-American female. To me, she's a beautiful person, beautiful soul. I said, okay, Michael, I'll tell you what. I take care of the label, you take care of the recipe. Okay, so I'm going to walk around in my house a little bit. Okay, Mike, I'll tell you what. I take care of the label. You take care of the recipe. I said, really? Hm. Okay. Like, you know, blowing it off. Well, a couple months later, she came back with that. She created it? The painting? She found an artist to draw a picture for the label. Oh, my God. From the label. I'm going to show you. I, I can't tell the story without giving credit or credit due. When she told me she got an artist to do it, that got me start panicking. I didn't have a recipe yet. <laughs> like you haven't done your part and she has no. done her. <laughs> but, but she showed me the, the, the draft of it coming along the way. The draft was coming. And when the product was done, she said, okay, Michael, how the recipe coming? I said, I got the recipe. That's a love story, okay? The contribution. There it is. And I got the print shop guy to design the label, which is what I did not. So I got the art, I got the artwork, I got, and I framed it. Before I framed it, I took it to the art shop and the guy took a photograph of it. And when we designed it, we came up with this label. We came up with that. Now, Miss Sorrell, M-E Sorrell, was not me. I didn't come up with that name. So when I made it, finally, I had some fellows over and Gerald was involved. You know Gerald and Barbara? Yep. <laughs> and another guy, his name is Kenneth. He's from New York. We're at my home celebrating about, oh, I made it. What? Got to give it a name. We're mixing the sorrel, drinking it with tequila. I'm barbecuing. We're partying. It's, yeah, man. And we check. We got to give it a name. We got to give it a name. So I was like, Mike's magic. Nah, nah, too juvenile. Then my man, he's either brother, black dude. He said, Miss Arrell, Miss Arrell. I said, what, Miss Arrell? Miss Arrell, I'll write it down. Miss Arrell, whoa, Michael Edward Sorrell. I took it to George and Gill Entrepreneur Center. When I bottled it, I had Miss Arrell on it. Took it to them, oh, Michael, that's delicious. Oh, because they've been advising me all along, get the lawyer and everybody up. Her name is Terry. She said to me, Michael, you, you have to give it a tag. I said, tag? What's a tag? My business knowledge was totally zero. No knowledge whatsoever. Zero. Then she said, Miss Sorrell, Jamaican holiday tea. I said, whoa, whoa, write it down. <laughs> I took out the holiday, I call it Jamaican tea. Okay. So now I'm, the three folds, the label for my lady friend I was dating, the name for my friend from New York, and the Jamaican tea, which is the tag from the Entrepreneur Center. The print shop guy. All I did was make the extract. That's all I did. And design the label with tell me print what I want. Everything else was contributed. Contributionism. Because in return, I share my product with them. I give like I've been giving all along. And out of me giving like giving all along, they came back and gave to me. So contributionism is what made me have my product in a bottle. So 
I thought I'd run on what you shared with me about people competing with each other rather than contributing their talent to make it happen. Which brings me to another thought about contributionism. Everybody talks about diversity. Big word. But you know something? In diversity, which we have a very diverse community in Bloomington, people from all over the world. What they don't talk about when you say diversity, in a diverse community, you have no unity. How can you have diversity when there's no unity? The diversity creates more separation. You got your culture, but you have diverse culture, which is separated. Is there a united night in Bloomington? You're promoting diversity, but where's the unity? You got this going on, that going on, you got that going, you got that going on. Everybody got their own little corner. So when you have diversity using diversity, it's another way of racism. That's what it really is. Because you separate. I share that with you because without unity, I would not have this. So this represents unity. I appreciate that you're sharing it. Exactly what you said. Without unity, diversity is meaningless. It's just a buzzword. Yes. And that's what's going on. So with contribution, it comes unity. Everybody's contributing what they have to give without having to worry about where they're from because you're contributing toward the cause. You have to have unity to contribute. It's so true. Yeah. It, we, we are blinded by this diversity when it means nothing. I agree completely because... Like you say, like people are just separating themselves. So they use diversity as a buzzword to continue racism. Yep. Saying diversity, you're pointing out the differences. It's just gonna build into the stereotype and the racism and the injustice. Wow. Wow. You see what I'm saying. Yeah. Eva. You see what I'm saying. I'm just talking from my experience. I'm not angry. I'm not bitter of any sort. I'm just being a realist. Mm -hmm. I'm into practicality. And diversity is not practical. And being practical about what I share with you and tell you my little story about the contributionism. And Bloomington can be unified if it's something that they really want to do, but there's no unity. There are people here that represent it. There are here, but it's not a massive level. Okay? It exists. It's not an illusion. And I fell into it. And that's why I know it exists. I told you that because I told you how this came about. You wouldn't be able to do it by yourself. No. When my lady friend said to me, I'll do the labor, she believed in, in what I was doing before I even did it. She already knows, even before you did. Yeah. I understand when people want to keep what they want to keep. Let's say traditional clothing. Not simply anyone can just wear it because there might be history in it. That's totally understandable. And so many other aspects and cultures within the community outside of that mm. needs to be connected. A lot of big talk we have today, Michael. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, I, and I'm glad, you know, I share with you the journey I've been on and the manifestation of this dream. Isn't it too late for that or aren't you too old for that? And I say to them, you know something, nothing before it's time. Nothing before it's time. I mean, some people go to their grave without living their dream, you know? And Dream of Delight, the name of my business, by the way, Dream of Delight, that's the name of a company I had in New Jersey that never manifested. I wanted to do a company, do a catering service, and the business never went. So it never even got registered. So when I started my business in Bloomington, and I had to come up with a business name. I went back to Dream of Delight and searched to see if anyone took the name. No, they did not. So Dream of Delight was born 20 years later from the time when I had the idea in the, in the food industry, because I was thinking about doing barbecues and do weddings and catering like that. And that was when I was, even before I started graduate school back in New Jersey. And I had the name. The idea of having a business was already in my mind, but it never manifested. 25 years later, here I am starting a business, making a beverage called the business Dream of Delight. <laughs> nothing before it's time that's the point I'm making here's neuroplasticity in a nutshell it's a word they use in psychological research science and neuroscience neuroscience they call it if you're used to doing the same thing every day over many many years it's like walking on a pavement your shoe 
heel get worn down, the pavement you're walking on get worn, and basically it becomes slippery. And, and then you kind of spend the rest of your life flatlined because you're not doing anything new. But if you were to get off that pathway and do something different, the cells will be able to grow back and create a new path, neuroplasticity. Your thinking change, your vision change. My new pathway is intuitiveness. In other words, I'm using the right side of my brain now more than ever because I'm listening to my creativity. The intuitive side of us, that's the universe side of us, which has been drowned out with the training of being analytical by using our brain, everybody become left-sided. So neuroplasticity is saying that if you shift from what you're doing to doing something new, you go back, the cell that's been worn out and you create a new pathway to do something different. Like my drink, we didn't talk about the medicinal properties. We you know, got to put it in there. So it's good for blood pressure. My blood pressure went from 140. Look, I'm a young man, okay? My blood <laughs> pressure went from 144 over 90 to 120 over 70. I was 180 pounds, I'm 160 pounds. I had uh, a joint issues, inflammation of the joints, which is like a form of arthritis, gone. And basically, I am healthier now ever than I was before because I changed and left what I was doing into doing something new. So from being a professor to being an inventor and being a creator, and they don't know they're dying because they never thought about switching out. So therefore, they kind of go to the grave early because they're dying, doing the same stuff, not having any new ideas to feel good about themselves. So here I am now, latter part of my life, doing something new, doing something different, feeling rejuvenated, feeling good. I feel like a million dollars. So I tell folks, nothing before it's time. Don't worry about when you do it. That's the problem people are having, how old you should be when they do it. Or even how you do it, because from what you've been telling me, sometimes you just don't know, and then you just figure out on the way. Uh, I have a little famous quote, there's no move without movement. I don't get it if you don't do something. So the point is no move without movement. So you got to have movement before you have a move. I, I feel like I have a second chance of life to do like I've never done before. Not like I have a second chance, like I failed, because there's no such thing as failure. For example, failure. We've been taught failure in a way that make us stop trying. How can you be a failure if you fail an exam in high school? That does not determine failure or success. So people call themselves a failure because they didn't do it at a certain time in life. No, that's society programming you to believe you're a failure. I've been living all this time, all my life. I cannot fail living. It's the inherent shame that has been planted on people about failure that makes people unable to continue on after they experience failure because they feel like, oh no, I did something and I didn't do well, shame. And that shame just kind of builds to your self-esteem. And that's how people stop doing what they're doing. Like losing a job. People tie their identity to the job. And they lose a the job, they lose the identity. I had an ego before, okay? I must say, I got checked on it in a way which I never anticipate that I was the way I was. I'm a professor and I didn't really see myself as such, but that's where I was. When I stepped away from that, I was identifying with that and I didn't realize it. And that's one of the reasons why people stay where they are. But what they don't realize is that what you're doing is not your identity. Whether you work as a professor, whether you work as a garbage picker, whether you work as a grocery clerk, whether you work in a farmland, whether you work whatever, work is work. And we're living in a caste system where we look on each other as my job is better than your job. But really, if you take the ego out of the picture, who are you really? But the ego is what they identify with. They don't realize they're identifying with the ego. I'm not better than you are, but really, that's how I was behaving without knowing I was behaving that way. So once the ego's in check and you get off the stage and leave the ego up there, you can watch the ego now. Because the ego don't want to be seen. That there's more to me than what I did. So what I'm doing now describe more of who I am because my ego is not really tied to what I'm doing. And I don't put my degree up front. Oh, I'm Dr. Edwards. No, I'm Michael Edwards, not doctor. I'm in the community. I'm Michael. I'm not on the job. I can say to young blood, the young men, young ladies who are going to college and you have electives to take in your curriculum, I would tell them, take a course in business just so you can get exposed. Because once you graduate, if you ain't got no plan, you got to work for somebody. Ain't nothing wrong with working. You got to work for somebody. There's nothing wrong with it. But what about working for yourself? But I never did. And because I never did, 
it delayed the process. But that's okay, because I had to learn about it on my own now. So now I'm learning business on my own. I'm educating myself with my education. So with my education, I'm educating myself. So to conclude, do you have a website that you want to promote or social media? You can go ahead. Uh, www.dreamersdelightco. D-R-E-A-M-E-R-S Delightco. Dot com. So Instagram is me.sorrel and then it'll be Michael Edwards will be my Facebook account. And thank you so much, Michael. This has been very amazing and wonderful experience for both of us. Yes, I would say so, Diva. And I look forward to interacting, okay? I look forward yep. to connecting again. Bye-bye, lady. For upcoming events, opportunities, and more info, give us a call at 812-370-0278 or visit our website at artisanalley.com.